Welcome to This Is Money podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and Simon Lambert today is Lee Boyce. And coming up, it's autumn statement time. In middays, the Chancellor will deliver his tax and spending plans for the year. But what will be in it? From stealth taxes to an ISA shake-up, inheritance tax, savings and first-time buyers. Lee and Simon get out their crystal balls and tell us what might be there, what won't be there and what they would like to see. Mr Hunt, if you are listening... It is not too late to take note. Don't forget to stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by Etoro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by Etoro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing. But first, the Chancellor will deliver his autumn statement on Wednesday. There have been noises about changes to inheritance tax, stamp duty, wages, pensions, potential ISA reforms. But what is really likely? What is even possible? Today, we're going to focus on five key areas. But first, briefly, Simon, Lee, welcome. What are we expecting the tone to be? A traditional conservative fiscal responsibility drive or a desperate pre-election tax giveaway? One for the rich, one for the poorest. Simon, what do you think? I had a dream about the autumn statement. Okay, and this, is, this, is not, this is not my Martin Luther King moment. I, I had a dream about the autumn statement and my dream was that after all this kerfuffle beforehand and all the predictions, he just stood up and said, I'm not going to announce loads of things. That's not what this is meant to be about. Did it really quickly and then sat down. And, and the big story about it was mm. that the autumn statement had only lasted 15 minutes. I don't think my dream's going to come true. I think that no. there's going to be some kerfuffle. I don't know whether we're going to go full on budget. I would question whether that's going to be left for March time, because after all, the autumn statement is not actually meant to be a budget. It has turned into Mm. a budget in in recent times, but it's not meant to be a budget. So is it the place to be announcing changes to tax thresholds, cutting inheritance tax, reforming ISAs? Um, moves to stamp duty, all those kinds of things that we're going to talk about. Probably not, but Mm. is this the kind of time when the Chancellor might be thinking that it would be a good idea to do that, politically speaking? Possibly so, because as we know, we are in the countdown to an election. It's going to have to come at some point in the next roughly year and a a bit. Um, And I think Jeremy Hunt would be very keen to set a different tone to the one that he's remembered for in the autumn statement last year, which is where he played stern school teacher after Quasi Quarteng's yeah. naughty schoolboy moment. Um, and he took away all of the stuff that Quasi had given us. And then he took away some more for good measure and told us all that we were in detention. We needed to knuckle down. And maybe if we were very, very good, at some point in about 20 years time, we might be able to have some fun again. Um, so I think he probably wants to change the message on that one. And I think that Rishi Sunak would be desperate for him to change the message on that one. Whether he will or not is another matter because we're definitely not out of the woods yet on the whole indebted nation, spending more than it brings in kind of problem, potential recession, inflation isn't done yet, all that stuff. Uh, Lee, do you have a dream that one day a Chancellor will stand up at the autumn statement and then sit down straight away afterwards after saying, well, that's it, there's not really a lot in this today? Um, Or do you think there might be a bit of a a kerfuffle, as Simon called it? Well, it's quite funny uh, there that Simon said he had a dream about the autumn statement because I had a nightmare Mm. about the autumn statement last night and it went on for six hours and there was a whole lot of nothing going on. No, I'm only messing, no. eh? (laughs) So welcome to the world of personal finance journalists. Yeah. As soon as work's done, personal finance out the window. It's not in my brain whatsoever. Um, The thing is, Jeremy Hunt was kind of brought in as Chancellor as a steady pair of hands. There's nothing worse than being described as a steady pair of hands, I don't think. 
uh, when it comes to um, coming into a, into a job like chancellor uh, in a way, because you know I, I get it. Like the last autumn statement, we obviously came off the back of that mad uh, September statement that just everything just went crazy for a time, mm-hmm. uh, and and he did come in and and try to steady the ship. The thing is, I, I kind of get the feeling now it's kind of a now or never moment, isn't it? In terms of right. rabbits out of the hat type thing you know Mr Osborne was very much a rabbit out of the hat uh kind of chance he'd like to think of himself as a bit of a magician I think uh but you get the impression that Jeremy Hunt is going to have to pull a number of rabbits out of the hat here because time the end of the road is coming and it's coming very fast so I would suspect that there will be a few things announced in here there's been plenty of kite flying uh, I would mm. say recent months, lots of things being trialed. How's this going to go down with the general public? Big one, I would say, inheritance tax. That seems to one minute it looks like cuts are on the cards. The next minute, no, that's not happening. Next minute, it looks like it is going to be happening again. And it and it also it feels like a bit of a, uh, a damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, type moment as well. I, and the reason why I say that is that we obviously had the inflation figure uh, this week, which is below five percent, which was one of Rishi's targets um but the like the reaction uh, from the general public and social media was kind of like what did you actually do to do that Richard? yeah quite you know, and, it, and it feels a bit like i feel like that could be the kind of general theme uh for this for this uh autumn statement to be honest because anything that's going to be announced is going to be pounced on from people that are not happy about it and the people that are semi happy about it are just going to say well it was common sense so yeah i don't know true. I, I, I wouldn't, damned if they do I, damned if they don't i wouldn't uh, fancy being a, a bit of chance if i was chancellor for the, for the day i'd run a hot bath get a nice big pile of cigars a bit of uh, champagne on ice and just let it all blow over because I, I i don't know what you do in this scenario i think it's a, a very tricky autumn statement this one really I, i'd be surprised if it is a slow and steady kind of one, I, you know, I understand it because it's Jeremy Hunt and that is quite a likelihood. But at the same time, I think he could throw out a few real kind of things into the works that maybe have been trialed, but maybe haven't been trialed as well, that could just come out of nowhere. But is Jeremy Hunt that kind of chancellor? Mm, not sure. Well, we'll see. Look, I'm really conscious. We're not, as we always say, we're not a political podcast and we're keen to delve into the sort of personal finance, not the overarching economics. But Simon, I do want to ask you something policy related in as much as there is a lot of speculation that well, we won't have a Conservative government for much longer. Now, I won't get you to <laughs> decide on whether you think that's going to be the case or not. But what people will be thinking is decisions that are made now If we do get a new party in power, and some of these decisions may not be popular with this new party in power, are they going to be reversed? Is it easy to reverse some of these decisions? When are they brought in? Is it, you know, the way that sort of policy around money is decided and and the time it takes for it to come in, is it easy just for it to be turned around? That's a tough uh... question. Sorry, Simon. That is a tough question. You you don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. What I was going to say is there was a wonderful insight into Lee Boyce's downtime there, what he does to relax in his yeah, spare quite. time. Hot bath, cold champagne, box of cigars. Um, but you've got two parties here which are competing to gain control of the narrative. And they're not quite sure what the narrative needs to be. I think the Tories are in a position where they need to convince everyone that the economy is doing better than expected um, and we're back on the up because of the government, not despite of the government, which is the general feeling uh, amongst most people in the country at the moment, be they traditional Tory voters or traditional Labour voters. I think most stuff, they look at it and go, well, I mean, it's all right, despite the government. Um On the flip side, the Labour Party is desperate to put a narrative in place that it is fiscally and economically competent because Labour is characterised as being fiscally and economically incompetent quite often or inept. Um, And the financial crisis was on their watch. Now, Gordon Brown obviously saved the world during the financial crisis. But if you dig a bit deeper, 
you will discover that Gordon Brown actually contributed to the financial crisis as well and was a man who stood up and gave a speech about light touch regulation in the city. Um, it was, you know, the financial crisis was triggered by American mortgages being sliced and diced and given to people who couldn't pay them back. But they, whilst it may have been Americans borrowing those mortgages, we were pretty reckless in our own mortgage lending and borrowing in this country. And a lot of the financial jiggery pokery that was going on with those mortgages was actually being done in London. So, you know, nobody's blameless there. But that was a long time ago. And actually now when people look back, maybe to those pre-2007 years, they think, OK, well, that didn't look too bad, actually. If that if now looked like that, I could be reasonably happy with that. So there's a lot of conflicting things going on here. And then you have parties that feel the need to play to their traditional voter base or to try and encourage some swing voters to vote for them, which is where you then start getting talk of inheritance tax cuts, for example, um, improvements to ISA saving and things like that. It's where I think personally the uh, conservative government needs to do something dramatic on stealth tax, which we're going to talk about in a minute, because it has it is getting absolutely lambasted, as I talked about a few weeks ago, from a lot of our readers for being a party of high tax now, because that always used to be the concern about Labour. But then you've got Labour, <clears throat> which doesn't feel that it can do too much, that feels like giving money to the to the wealthier end of society. So you start getting pronouncements on things that might be reversed. And we've already seen this with the removal of the pension lifetime allowance. Now, the pension lifetime allowance is, it needed removing. It was pretty daft. We thought it was going to go up substantially. It was just axed completely. But when it came in, um, you know, in, in fact, when the Labour government left power, it was at £1.8 million. Pounds. But the Tories had managed to drag it all the way down to £1 million, pounds, where it was starting to cause really big problems. They said they were going to get rid of it. Obviously, you need to take the opposite position. You can't say, well, do you know what? Actually, getting rid of it is probably a good idea. And when we were in charge, it was much higher than that. So we would have raised it as well anyway. You need to go on the attack. So you had a scenario where um, Rachel Reeves, for example, shadow chancellor, said, well, I'll bring the lifetime allowance back in. What she didn't say was at what level. And maybe she would bring it back in at the lay level that they left it at when the Labour Party left power. Maybe she'd bring it back in at a level even higher than that. Maybe, you know, maybe she'd bring in a lifetime allowance of five million pounds. We don't know. But the speculation is, OK, well, if she says that they bring it back in at a million pounds. So all of a sudden you've got the people stuck in the middle of this who were just trying to plan their pensions. And it's causing, you know, all kinds of ructions in the NHS and things like that. Sitting there thinking, well, what do I do? And if I do something, does it then get reversed? Does it get unpicked? Am I going to end up with a tax bill? You don't create the certainty that you need for people to to move on. So I think that I think that what we need is for the opposition, obviously to oppose if they want to oppose, but to oppose in a constructive way when they think about, OK, what is this going to do to people's finances and people's behaviour in the time between now and the election? Because what you don't want is all of these things being brought in, as you said, Georgie, and then all of a sudden being unpicked or the feeling that they're going to be unpicked. So you just end up in this position of paralysis in between, particularly if some of them are actually sensible moves. I always think it's worth not opposing a sensible move mm, just because generally. you're on the other team. That goes both ways. Quite as I said, not a political podcast. So let's dig into some of the potential detail there. One that I imagine is probably quite popular across the board is stealth taxes. From fiscal drag to Lee's hated insurance premium tax, if the government can find sneaky ways, any government that is, it seems, to squeeze that extra pound from our pocket, they will. Listen to Podcast Past for a little bit more detail into uh, stealth taxes, but... Uh, Simon, just how bad are they? How much are they costing us? Which areas is it affecting our money? The main area that is affecting us is in income tax. And this is where stealth tax has become really, really quite bad, has a very heavy impact, starts to intersect with some other really weird bits of our tax code that create all kinds of odd scenarios and marginal tax rates that are sky high and also isn't really very stealthy because Mr Hunt stood up and openly said he was going to do this and the you know extend the freeze on income tax thresholds 
I am extending the freeze on income tax thresholds. It was almost as clear as that. And the Chancellor before him had said that they were going to freeze him anyway. I, maybe it was Rishi who froze him in the first place, I think, when he was Chancellor. It was Rishi, wasn't it? But anyway, the effect of this is quite dramatic. So what you do here is instead of raising the rate of income tax, which would trigger lots of arguments, you just keep the thresholds in the same place and you don't raise them with either inflation or wage increases. And really, those thresholds should go up with one of those two things, either average wages or inflation. I think inflation is the simpler measure to raise them by because we have seen in recent years that average wage figures are not the most reliable. They can be skewed by various things. So you've got the level at which you start paying tax, below which you pay nothing on your income. Um, that has risen substantially, to be fair, to the Tories. Under the Tory government has risen substantially, but then that's now stuck. So what you're doing is in a year where inflation has been at times double digits, um, going back a year ago, it was double digits. It's now come down, but it's only come down to 4.6%, still pretty high. You are taking the money that people need just to keep pace with how much more expensive their life is getting, and then you're taking some of it away in tax. And actually that hits the lower paid hardest because actually inflation on essential items tends to be higher um, or skew higher than, than elsewhere. You then have the move from basic rate to higher rate tax. And this is the one that is hitting lots and lots of people and is forecast to hit many, many more people. And that's the point at which you go from paying 20% income tax to 40% income tax. And so you've got a scenario where somebody gets their pay rise and all that their pay rise does is keeps pace with inflation. You've got to get a pretty big pay rise to keep pace with inflation. You're lucky if you get a pay rise that keeps pace with inflation over most of the last year. But the government says, yeah, we're not going to tax you in line with that. We're going to keep the threshold the same. And 40% of that pay rise, we're having that. So doing this um, has created the scenario where, according to the IFS, by the 2027-28 tax year, 8.9 million Britons will be paying higher rate taxes compared to just 3.2 million when the Labour government left office in 2010. That is absolutely immense. Um, it is the equivalent to adding 6p per pound to both the basic and higher rates of income tax. And there will be an astonishing 80% more people paying higher rate taxes by 2027 than there would be if the threshold hadn't been frozen. And if it had risen by September's inflation figure each year, instead of being frozen in 2021 from next April, the higher rate tax threshold should be £60,866, not £50,270. At which point you then get the scenario where this intersects with other things. Because the other thing that happens above £50,000 is that people who have children, even if just one person earns more than £50,000, you could have two people earning £49,999 and it's absolutely fine. But if one person, you only have one earner, earning £50,000, they start getting child benefit taken away. And that can bump up their marginal tax rate to 50% or nearly 60%. You then have the scenario further up the scale where the uh, 45p tax threshold, which used to be at £150,000, that also didn't go up. So you've seen a big fiscal drag there. We're obviously going to feel really sorry for people earning £150,000 plus right now. Everybody get out your tiny violins. But, you know... Those people pay a lot of tax and you should still treat them fairly, particularly as they pay a lot of tax. That threshold hasn't gone up. And instead, actually, it's now gone down to £125,140, which is a really weird number to put a tax threshold at until you realise that that's the point at which people's personal allowance stops being taken away from them once they earn more than £100,000. Get out your slightly bigger tiny violins for all the poor people earning more than £100,000. But that £100,000 level, that's been in place for ages. And the removal of the personal allowance there creates a 60% tax rate. So the tax rates in this country actually go 20, 40, 60, 45, which is nuts. That's not mm -hmm. a way to run a tax system. You've then also got the scenario where there's stealth tax on um, savers and investors, because what the other thing the government's done 
is it is staged crackdown on investors. It is dramatically cut the capital gains tax threshold. Mm-hmm. And what the rate of tax you pay influence income tax you pay reflects the rate of capital gains tax you pay. It has dramatically slashed the dividend tax threshold. Again, the income tax level affects that. It hasn't raised the personal savings allowance. Um, again, the income tax threshold affects that. And so there's all these things that come into play here and means that there is this colossal stealth tax raid being staged on people's incomes. And I think it's probably time the government did something about it. Lee, as Simon said, it's not just your wages and all that sort of thing that are affected. It's all sorts of things, your savings, your investments, inheritance tax bans frozen. You spoke last week. It's not quite the fiscal drag, but it's certainly a a stealth tax, isn't it? The insurance premium tax that's been going up and up and up and up. Listen to last week's podcast for that one. It's like Simon said. The tax system needs to be fair. You need to understand it. And it does just feel, doesn't it? Any which way they can sneakily get this money from us, they will. But it's going to, if they unfreeze them or thaw these bands, as it were, it's going to cost billions. Well, exactly. This this uh, stealth tax in itself, the income tax bans, uh, is forecast to raise something like fifty billion pounds. Mm. And, we, and we always spoke in the aftermath of the pandemic of how was we how were we going to pay for the pandemic and all of the kind of measures that were brought out. Well, things like this, I presume, <laughs> it's kind of how how these things are, are have been paid for because this is such a huge amount of money that. Uh, people are having taken away from their pay packets to the point where I think a lot of people are actually getting fed up, young professionals and might be looking, working elsewhere with with uh, lower tax uh, system, t- tax rates and, and systems that are a little bit, you could argue, fairer or not taking away as much as their pay, of their pay packet. And um, I think when you say one in six uh, workers uh, are forecast to become higher rate taxpayers, I mean, that is a, an absolutely astronomical number. Now, you talked about uh, insurance premium tax there. That's the one we were talking about last week. I mean, that's that's now taking in almost seven and a half billion pounds a year uh, to the Treasury compared to something like three billion a decade ago. I mean, that's a massive jump. That's a, a, um, a levy on insurers, essentially, at 12 percent. Um, that that directly gets passed on to people that take out car insurance, home insurance, pet insurance, travel insurance. If you take out all of those, you know, your bill is likely to be higher than the £264 uh, a year that people, households are currently forking out in just this tax. It's just tax uh, that's being taken away and we're getting tax, 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 tax. And I think people are just getting fed up of it. And and like, you know, for example, in that IPT one, if you're a a motorist, you have to have car insurance. You know, it's it's like you have to have car insurance and then you have to pay for uh, road tax and you have to pay for petrol where you've got fuel duty on it. And it's just tax and more more tax and tax. And where do we draw the line? How do we you know, start to get a fairer tax system where we're not all feeling like we're paying more tax, no services and nothing seems to be really dramatically improving anywhere. So what is this no. actually doing and, and, and right. how is it enhancing our lives? And I think a lot of people are getting incredibly fed up with it, Georgie. Um, but as you say, you start thawing these and it's going to cost a lot of money. Is it something that could happen uh, next week? I would really would say probably highly likely no i can't (laughs) i'm going to ask you the likelihood scoring out of 10 shortly for all of these but it does just make you mean you know when you said you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't it makes me think you know what if they don't if they don't do something about taxes then well it goes against what rishi sunak was saying he wants a a low tax conservative party and, and it goes against probably conservative principles here but if they do lower taxes a little bit or they do something like this people go like you said well, you should have done it before, or you could probably go further than that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's uh, yeah, honestly, I don't know what they're going to do. But look, likelihood scoring out of ten for something to do with stealth taxes. Are they going to make them less stealthy? Our survey says Simon out of ten likelihood scoring. I'm going to give it a six. I'm okay. going to give it a six because I think it gets bumped up by the fact that this is moved well out of the stealth arena and into the publicly yeah. public knowledge True. arena and um has any if anybody has been reading articles and read comments under articles on websites including our own and others they might reason realize quite how angry people are about this um but i'm going to drag my score down 
due to the fact that it was only a year ago that Jeremy Hunt stood up and announced that he was imposing this stealth tax. I guess his out is things are a bit better now than they were then, so I can ease it a bit. Um, I don't know. I think if there was going to be a radical overhaul of the tax system to really sort out the mess, maybe it would come in March rather than now. But fingers crossed it comes now. All right. So sit for Simon, Lee? Uh, for income tax bans, uh, 0. 0.5. Uh, for, oh. IP, uh, for IPT, I think there's actually a bigger uh, chance of that happening because there's been quite a lot of pressure from uh, trade bodies. So I'm going to give that a 7, seven out of 10. Nice, Car insurance, nice. home insurance has become very expensive this year. And I think that, again, that's hit the public of cottoned on to how much more expensive it's gotten. And I think they might do something about that IPT. All right. Well, I'm going to still put you down as 0.5 just because that's more entertaining. Inheritance tax. Let's go there. Uh, one of those bans that have been frozen. Uh, lots of noise. The Britain's most hated tax is for the chopping block, even though I think about 4% of estates actually pay it. Simon, is this a sop to the rich? Not really. No. The current inheritance tax system is actually a sop to the rich because if you look at the figures produced by the Office of Tax Simplification when it was asked to look into this um, around about the time that Jesus was a boy um, and nobody's done anything about it ever since, those figures demonstrated that actually the genuinely rich uh, pay a lower effective rate of inheritance tax than merely the sort of rich. The sort of rich are actually really quite rich compared to lots of other people, but most of them are only sort of rich because it's basically down to house price inflation um, and lifetime savings and wealth that they've built up. Um, the really rich, the people with multiple millions of pounds um, running into tens of millions of pounds, into hundreds of millions of pounds, and then out of hundreds of millions of pounds and into billions, um, tend to splash out a bit on some serious inheritance tax avoidance and pay a much lower rate of inheritance tax. So I think you have to define your SOP to the rich, really. Um, it's definitely a SOP to the uh, south of England, which has mm. the inheritance tax problem due to sky high house price inflation. Ultimately, you know, that is unearned. Um, People will argue, well, I paid my mortgage, I paid my taxes all that time. It's outrageous. I'm being taxed twice on this. But on the flip side of that, actually, it didn't come from the mortgage you paid, didn't come from the taxes you paid. It came from house price inflation. But the flip side of house price inflation is that for many of those people, they then have children who can't afford to buy a home in the area that they grew up in. So they're having to play bank of mum and dad and give their children money just so they can live in their hometown. The entire thing is a complete um, shambles, uh, mm. to be honest. And like many things in this country, can be largely blamed on high house price inflation. Um, so I don't think it is a sop to the rich. It will definitely be painted as a sop to the rich. But quite. I think what's also, what's also quite important is that despite the fact that so few people pay inheritance tax, it is regularly named Britain's most hated tax People just really don't like the idea of it. Bam. And they also really don't like the 40% bit of it, right? Because 40% is nearly half. And the way people's brains compute that, despite the relatively high allowance that you have, you could basically, as a married couple, million pounds, inheritance tax free, that's a lot. Mm. They don't compute that bit. They compute the nearly half of my savings and my home and all that other stuff and i think that's why it is hated so much which brings us into what are they going to do about it well yes i mean we'll get to the likelihood scoring of them actually doing anything about it but actually i'd quite like to know what you think they should do about it so i mean i'm assuming from listening to you that actually cutting the 40 percent might not be a bad place to start but you know mr hunt could will probably be listening i mean i'm sure he's a big fan of the show well i mean i like to hope he's been reading or listening in the past because if i'm going to be entirely honest astonishingly the story that has emerged this week appears to be the thing that i've been calling for for donkey's years mm. which is to cut the rate i don't think we need to massively raise the thresholds I think we need to sort out the bit, for example, where if you were a brother and a sister, 
and you left your property to each other, you don't get to benefit from that um, passing on to your spouse or your civil partner your own allowance. I, I think that doesn't reflect the way that people live in modern society. You know, mm-hmm. family members, brothers, sisters, the direct descendants element, all that kind of stuff. I don't think that's fair. But I don't really think that we na- need to dramatically raise the threshold. We should have been raising it with inflation or asset price inflation or whatever. You know, we should have just been doing that anyway. That's just a principle. Let's work on the basis that my view is we should always do that anyway. But beyond that, as I said, a million pounds is quite a lot. And I think it's the rate that's the problem. And my argument has always been cut it to 20%. It feels much more palatable. 20% doesn't sound that bad. Um, Gives much less incentive to rich people um, to avoid it. I mean, they, they still will. But if you cut down on some of the loopholes and go, look, the rate's going to be 20%. We're closing this loophole here, this loophole there, and that loophole there. But the rate is just 20% now, and we think that's fair. I don't think that that sounds that bad, to be honest, compared to the position that we're in. Now, you could argue Mm. that we shouldn't have an inheritance tax at all, which many countries don't. Um, But I think cutting the rate might be a good idea. And astonishingly, as I said, this is the the rumour doing the rounds that that's what he's going to do cut the rate the question is though is will he cut the rate or will he cut the rate and then remove half the allowances as well you know the classic i will give with this hand and i will be taking away with the other move that chancellors so love right lee this is one of those key ones that you think this will never stay surely if a late Labour Party to come in. But look, um, what are your thoughts on inheritance tax, Lee? Well, I think if you've listened to the show, I think you you would have heard this has never affected me in any way, shape or form. But I always feel like IHT is a bit of a a kind of tax on success. You know, if you're a kind of self-made business person uh, and you've managed to do well in life, I think it starts to get to a point where IHT sort of like it feels like a problem that's way down the hill. And then you start coming down the hill and then it's there and you're like, Oh, I don't have a clue what to do. And I think the 40% uh, rate is is incredibly, I think that's what gets people. It's incredibly high. And as Simon says, I, I, I've i always agreed with Simon. I think the 20% rate is just a way more kind of palatable way of, of doing this. I don't think that they will really tinker with the allowances all that much. Um, and if you wanted my probability score on this, I know you're about yep. to ask. I'm going to yep. give this. I'm going to give this a nine point five. I think we've had so much wow. more about this in the last couple of months that something big's afoot. Um, and I reckon it, it could be the twenty percent. Wow, Lee, nine point five. You're from zero point five to nine point five. You're not sitting on the fence here, are you, Simon? The likelihood scoring out of ten is. I mean, it's got being trailed amongst the lobby reporters written all over it. <laughs> so I'm going with an I'm going with a nine for them doing something on inheritance tax. I'm going with a seven for the for it being the cutting the rate thing. Might be something different. Like what? Raising it hundred percent full right. inheritance tax. Just do that. All right. Got Cut labour off at the knees. That's it for part one. I'm joined now by Sam North of eToro for our weekly look at what's been going on on the markets. Hello, Sam. How's the past week been? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, markets continued uh, to see an early Santa rally, which was driven by US inflation, which has kept the 10 year bond yield below 4.5 percent and also supported by oil prices staying under 80 bucks concerns of a government shutdown well they were pretty much averted uh, which has helped to contribute to the calming of u.s china tensions relief bounces uh, sector wise led by solar reit and small cap stocks although walmart faced uh, a slump but targets or due to their quarter three Results. Alibaba made headlines, uh, cancelling its spin off plans. Uh, back to the inflation, both in the US and UK, they reported lower than expected figures, uh, which has prompted those rate cut expectations to be brought forward. US May 2024 and the Bank of England mid 2024. As of now, commodities, as mentioned, Brent below $80, uh, a little bit down to inventory surges, but also the lingering doubts over China's demand. And just finally, on this week, Bitcoin has extended its rally, reaching 37k at one point uh, amid hopes for that imminent spot ETF. Bitcoin has been on quite the tear, hasn't it, over the last couple of months? 
It really has, and it's been resilient. You know, when other markets have been moving lower, it's been moving higher. I think a lot of, is down to the ETF and the halving next year. So I'd be a little bit careful for anyone with that FOMO, not jumping in, because sometimes it could be the buy the rumor, sell the fact kind of uh, angle. And what do we have to look forward to next week? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to note next Thursday is Thanksgiving in in uh, in the US so likely to be relatively quiet overall but we're obviously keeping an eye on that Black Friday and Cyber Monday the the sales there potentially impacting retail and e-commerce sectors however we do have some uh, things to keep an eye on as well next week uh, significant earnings from Nvidia which saved the market back in quarter 1 you've got low you've got neo you've got deer and company and zoom all reporting next week as well as Manchester United uh, who, of course, uh, are in the news at the moment uh, amid a 25% uh, buyout from Ineos and uh, Jim Ratcliffe. Political developments uh, also. We've got the UK autumn sentiment, Dutch election on Wednesday uh, as well. We've also got some PMI data, which is scheduled uh, next week, just to keep an eye on the, the sort of the global economic health of various regions. And we've got minutes from the Federal Reserve, and also worth keeping an eye on uh, the OPEC meeting, which happens over the weekend. So while volumes will be lower, there's still stuff to keep an eye on. I could hear you could barely contain your excitement there, Sam, mentioning (laughs) Black Friday. I know, yeah. That's what the week's all about for you, isn't it, mate? (laughs) 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 Okay, thank you very much. We'll speak to you this time next week. If you can tear yourself away from the shopping. Well, maybe not. (laughs) Welcome back. Talking about rumours rife with the autumn statement, there is one that is I've been doing it for quite some time. They're talking about a surprise boost for savers and investors in the form of an ISA upgrade. But will that involve raising the allowance, trimming the number of ISAs, or a total rule shake-up? Uh, Lee Boy, say potted history of the humble ISA, if you would. Oh, when you said ISA, Georgia, the, the hair stood up on my on my back of my neck. Oh, I was so excited. Like, honestly, oh. it's just, oh, the tingles, they're real. Regulars to the podcast <laughs> will know how excitedly he got and then didn't get excited because actually there was no ISA season for a few years. But yeah, then he's excited <laughs> again. Lee. There has been this year, though, Georgia, and that's the thing. Um, look, I, ISAs are, are, are an incredibly successful, popular product, especially uh, this year. They've had their moment back in the sun again as people uh, shield away their, their money from the tax ban and the current ISA uh, allowance for the financial year is £20,000. It's been at £20,000 for a number of years, but that was from a, a big jump up from what it has been in previous years. So ISAs were in- introduced in April 1999. Uh, before that, you had PEPs, which was like the precursor to stocks and shares ISAs. And you had TESAs, which were a kind of precursor to what is now a cash ISA. And in the most simple form, uh, you open either a cash ISA or and or a stocks and shares ISA and you squirrel away money in there and any interest you earn and any cash that you keep inside that building it up over the years is shielded away from the tax man now the argument with ISAs and why providers say it gets complicated you're allowed to open more than one ISA in a financial year but they have to be different types of ISA so you can have one cash ISA you open up and you put money into Mm -hmm. and you can have a stocks and shares ISA that you can open and put money into you can't open two stocks and shares ISA in a year you can't open two different cash prices in a year unless you use a flexible ISA which some providers do offer that then is another thing and people just get a bit modeled by it all see Lee you say it's it's not complicated but (laughs) I love how listeners of this show get a real insight into just how really boring we are, because another kind of personal finance pub chat, we were discussing about, you know, you can open more than one cash ISA in a year, but you have to transfer all the money across. And does a transfer across count as opening a new one? And (laughs) this does get quite, quite complicated and quite dark. Sorry about uh, about that, everyone. But hang on, Simon's dreaming about autumn statements, so cut me some slack here. I think the LISA, again, that's lifetime ISA. That's another one that is, if talking about thresholds, is really ripe for some sort of a change. Yeah, so the the kind of uh, what's been trialled, and this brings me nicely onto the, the autumn statement, what uh, has been kind of 
again a bit of kite flying is simplifying this a bit so that you would be able to open more than one cash item for example so you know you could have an easy access a fix all that kind of thing uh, in terms of stocks and shares item you could open it with more than one provider which you know the providers themselves are saying it would be a good thing because you could road test uh you know the platform before you put all your eggs into it you know you can give it a go see if you like it if you don't like the customer service or you don't like the way it is you don't have to wait a whole year to be thinking about how to how to get the next one and i think that it kind of could help sort of free up and make it a bit more of a seamless process but ices are complicated georgie for for providers as well because you know the red tape that's involved in actually offering a, an isa it does put providers off so you will see in our savings tables you have providers that offer easy access accounts and fixed rates account fixed rate accounts but they don't offer ices and for the reason being that they're just more red tape and it takes more kind of uh you know manpower essentially uh and i won't name the bank because uh, we're doing it we're doing a bit of a report on it at the moment but one of the banks did offer a fairly good ice rate over the summer and it was so popular that it seems that they've been swamped with transfers in and uh, new accounts being opened that they've bodged a lot of people's um uh, you know iso openings because they they they're complicated so they they're talking about streamlining this making it so that more people uh can move around and make it a bit more free we have so many questions every year about how isos work and there's a reason for that because you know once you take that surface level of you've got twenty thousand pounds cash ISA, stocks and shares ISA, once you start delving into as you say the pop chat of can i transfer it into this can i open this product can i do that that's when people start to get get tripped up and get a bit confused by it and a lot of the time probably just go oh i'll just stay where i am because this is just too much so any kind of streamlining of that is good the other thing they've talked about a little bit as well is this great british ISA. Uh, about basically having an ISA where, <laughs> yeah, I know there could be another <laughs> ISA, a BISA, uh in which money would be used for investing. <laughs> I, can, I can see head in hands here. Sorry, oh this. god, hands. but yeah, we might be getting another one, Georgie, uh, which would would, would be best British firms. More so, ISAs. Yeah. Um, so more ISAs. Is that what we need? Less ISAs. An ISA change. More money to be allowed into go into ISAs. Less ices, more simplification. Too complicated. Got into a bit of a muddle. I am very much pro the idea of making it that people can open more than one ISA of the same type each year. I think, again, something I've been banging the drum on for a very long time. It's detrimental to uh, consumers uh, from a behavioural point of view because it if you've got £20,000 is a lot of money, right? This is why I don't necessarily think the allowance needs to be raised. Obviously, it needs to go up with inflation, duh, 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 as I said before. Um, but £20,000 is a lot. Most people can't put £20,000 of new money into any form of savings or investments in any given year. But I think that people who are putting in large amounts, for example, might want to put some into a fixed rate and some into an easy access, some that they can get out quite quickly. And this is more important, as Lee said, because of savings rates going up and more people being hit by savings tax and some into a fixed rate that they can lock away. I think that if you look at stocks and shares ISAs, some uh, investment platforms are better for funds and investment trusts. Some are better for buying shares. Uh, some are better for getting somebody to do the work for you, the digital wealth management platforms. And so it would make sense um, and be potentially good financial planning to put some of your money into the one where you pick it yourself and some of it into the one where you get the professional system, not the professional, but the professional system to do it for you. It's also highly detrimental to consumers on the basis that our entire consumer economy is built on the idea of competition. And the way the system works at the moment is it reduces competition. There isn't as much competition between banks and building societies because they know they have a semi-captive audience. Once you put your money into one ISA in that year, you can't put your money into another cash ISA. So they don't really need to compete on rates as hard as they could. It's detrimental in the investment world even more where you've got new entrants coming to the market um, who people can't use because they've already put a bit of money in their Hargreaves Lansdowne or their Interactive Investor or their AJ Bell account that year into one of the giants. And so they can't, they have like, I would like to dabble a little bit with that one, but, um, you know, this is where I have most of my investments and I don't want to be, you know, managing over so many places that 
um, I only put new money into this one this year and I don't want to use all of my allowance for this one this year. So I'm just going to not bother with that new entrant. Makes it harder for new entrants to come to the market, gives less incentive for those existing players to bring their fees down by as much as they should do. And if you look at the cost of fund dealing and share dealing fees, they're still very, very high across a lot of those players in the market. I think that this would be an improvement. So for savers, for investors, for competition, and also if we can do it with pensions, why can't we do it with ISAs? You can open as many pensions as you want in a year. All you have to do is stay below the annual allowance and you keep track of that yourself. It's pretty simple, you know, so if you can do it with pensions, which are arguably a more complicated um, system, then why can't you do it with ISAs? So bring that in. All right. Our likelihood scoring out of 10, Simon Lambert for an ISA shakeup. I'm giving nine, but only on the basis that the Chancellor stands up and says that he's going to do uh, one of those sort of, we're going to look at it and come up with a better way of doing things. I'd give actually changing ISAs dramatically a five. Right. Okay. So bluster nine. Uh, nine, five. Point, nine point nine nine. I'm sticking, sticking it out is that there. To just Is that to the chat? And the the action, or just all of it? Nine point nine. All of it. It's going to go ISIS. all guns blazing on ISIS. It's going to be right. big on ISIS. I've got, right. got this feeling. It's just like something in the pit of my stomach. I'm going to have a dream this weekend, and it's going to be Jeremy Hunt. And I'm going to talk about it at the pub. Right amazing. at the start, ISIS. They're too complicated, and we're giving it a big shake up. And then he'll bring out George Osborne, who will reveal, reveal the details. He's good at bringing people <laughs> back, isn't he? So, uh, anyway, we're going to stick with savings. There is a suggestion that the personal savings allowance could be raised. Lee, don't lean back in your seat just yet because you're, you're required. Yeah, we go. And he's what's the PSA, Lee? All right, not, Lee, not, to, re- not to repeat myself, George. It'll be a thousand pounds for basic rate taxpayers, 500 pounds for. Uh, higher rate taxpayers you don't get one if you're an additional rate taxpayer this is how much interest you can earn over the financial year uh and it's become more of a pertinent thing uh, in the last sort of 18 months because savings rates have been going up and you could be basically squirreling away sort of 16 20 grand and surpassing this now because lo and behold we've had savings rates above five percent for the first time in a very long time including easy access and fixed rates Um, And for that reason, people are more likely to be facing a a tax bill on their savings. That's why the ISA allowance is so important. £20,000, as we both said, is a very high amount of money to be able to be squirrelling away and why it should be the cornerstone of your savings planning. Um, Yeah, but there's been talks about this potentially rising uh, somewhat, you know, because more people are getting caught in this sort of tax trap and are confused by it. And I can totally understand why, because again, it's quite a confusing thing. I don't think that the likelihood for me is I don't think that this will get touched. Um, You know, you could argue that perhaps the limit should be 1500 pounds for um, basic rate taxpayers, for example, and that maybe the higher rate taxpayer level could be 750 or something like that. But I don't know. I, I, I kind of, I think that would be tinkering for tinkering's sake. But that's my own personal view. Yeah. I think that we have an ISA uh, system that's, that's pretty fair in terms of how much you can squirrel away from the tax man. And I just can't see them touching the, the personal savings allowance. Any other ways that savers could be helped, do you think, if you were to be Chancellor for the day? Uh, I'd maybe be putting more pressure on uh, banks, major banks, yeah. to be kind of putting up. I mean, there has been the Treasury Select Committee I feel like I've been banging on about this for about 12 months with a lot of bluster and words and, you know, sort of talk, but not much action, uh, to be quite frank, because you only have to have a look at the easy access rates on offer from big major banks to know that they're still ripping savers off. You know, we're at base rate 5.25%, Best Buy easy access rate 5.22%, Lloyds Bank 1.4% easy access rate. You know, that is just not good enough. Um, and it's the same with all of the all of the big five banks. I think um, most of I think the average is one point eight percent over the five banks on an easy access. That's you know astonishing. Um, I, but again, if you're a frequent listener to this podcast, I also think that savers have to help themselves. And if that you're on someone on that rate, um, because you you've not cottoned onto it or you've just not bothered to move, 
uh, so it's hard, isn't it? Because you, uh, do I want the government to be meddling in and going, right, banks, mm. you've got to be offering at least 4% on your easy access rates or you're going to get fined. I don't know. In, in a way, I'm kind of like, but banks are kind of free to do what they want. And it's up to savers to move the cash. So I kind of talked myself out of that one, haven't I? Don't make me chance yeah. today. I'll just be right. in Simon? Don't make him chancellor for the day because you'll have to get him out of the bath first. And that's true, put that's the true. champagne and cigars down, Lee. We need you. Mm. You're meant to be oh, delivering oh. your budget or your autumn statement. Uh, I'm actually going to take the opposite position to Mr. Boyce here. And I'm okay. going to say personal savings allowance, definitely something that you could do something about, wouldn't really actually cost the government any money because savings rates have gone up by so much that in theory you could raise it by quite a bit and it would end relatively neutral with where we were, particularly as there was no expectation that interest rates would rise by as much as they would do and so quickly. So there's not any forecasts that they were going to get this revenue in or going to need this revenue. So why not give a bit back to savers? I'm saying take that personal savings allowance, double it from 1,000 to 2,000. I mean, I would just give higher rate taxpayers the same personal savings allowance as well. But you could double that as well to a thousand. You could even give those people on paying forty-five p tax a little bit, just a just a little snifter of a of a savings allowance, and and it wouldn't really cost the government any money. Chances of them doing it low, but opportunity high. Nice, like it. But but how low, Simon? Out of I'm ten, gonna, I'm going to go four out of ten. Oh, four. Yeah. For doing it, unless of course. Mr. Hunt is listening. You can't. Well, I'm At which point this, he'll have realised mm. this is a fantastic idea that we've come up with, and he'll and I'll raise it to a nine out of ten. Um, but I've get, definitely got nine out of ten opportunity score here. Nice, I like it. But I'm banning from now on in. We've only got one more to go. But um, any talk of a mark out of ten for what they say, um, because that's just nonsense. Uh, Lee Boyce, out have, you, of 10. Have, you, have you suggested that I've been cheating at this game the entire way through this podcast? Yeah, you're basically going, I'm going to go a nine or a five or a two. Somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to go ten. ten or zero. Yeah, yeah. somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, honestly, Lee, Lee's just gone all out, though. Lee, are you going to go all out for changing the savings doodars? I'm going to give this a 0.0001 out of 10. Not how many noughts was that? Not point not 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 one. Got it. Yeah, not point not 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 one. Lovely. All right. Finally, mortgages and first time buyers. Could we see more help here? Another thing that was mooted a while ago: stamp duty for the chop. Or do we just step away from the property market and stop tinkering about with it? Simon, what are the suggestions here? Can I just say that the stamp duty has now been messed with? So many times in the last few years, including the will they, won't they pantomime quasi quarting Liz Trust, Jeremy Hunt comes in afterwards drama that I'd actually forgotten what they'd done with it. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I read something there. Yeah. Day, it was like, oh, right. Yeah. yeah. OK. So um, they brought in a special exemption for first time buyers. Um but then Jeremy Hunt time limited it. The question is, is whether you just do something about this properly. I mean, it still kicks in above two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. The the, you know, beyond that, um, the next six hundred and seventy five thousand pounds, the portion from two hundred and fifty to nine hundred twenty five thousand pounds, you pay five percent stamp duty on. Um, and uh, you then next five hundred seventy five thousand pounds, you pay ten percent on, and so on and so on. This can lead to really quite substantial bills. Um, and uh, it does stop people moving. It does hamper the property market. People, it, it will have moved. I personally would have moved at least one more time in my life if it wasn't for very high stamp duty. Um, I, it, you know, I think it is a problem. First time buyers have got a bit of a get out at the moment. I, I'd like to see them just make that permanent. I'd like to see them just change stamp duty substantially. I, I'd like to see stamp duty dramatically reduced but permanently no more holidays the hot the problem with stamp duty is all of the reforms to it have often then been completely overwhelmed by stamp duty holidays which as we all know from you know the basics of retailing uh, and economics is if you time limit a discount then you tend to try to build up a rush 
in order to get that discount, particularly at the end. And actually people might end up, you can start to get less, you know, people can bump the prices up because people are trying to get discount and so on and so on. Just get rid of the holiday stuff, just cut stamp duty and then just leave it alone. Put it in a box and forget about it. Is that the only suggestion for mortgages and, and first time buyers stamp duty? No, there's all kinds of suggestions of what we need to do to, well, come to on. help first time buyers. We've um, got a scoring out of 10 to do here, Simon. Oh, my God. I mean, we've got some kind of replacement for the help to buy stuff, you know, something to help people with small deposits. Um, we've got ideas around green mortgages, around green stamp duty. I heard talk of this the other day. People buy a property, then they do energy efficiency improvements in the first couple of years. They can claim some of their stamp duty back. Um We've got all kinds of things going on to try to combat the fact that basically house prices are just too high in this country. Um, but, you know, ultimately, actually, maybe you just leave the market to it because mortgage rates have gone up substantially and house prices are coming down and maybe just don't meddle. Because Isn't there an argument, Lee, that some of the issues that we've had with the housing market are because of this constant tinkering about? Should we just leave the thing well alone for a little bit? Oh, the tinkering, the meddling, the 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 property market madness. Yeah, I mean, it is just as Simon says, it 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 distorts what goes on in people's you know kind of habits. And, and Simon's saying there about you know at least one time in his life he's been put off moving for stamp duty. I mean that that's quite incredible. And how many more people were in that boat? And how many? Uh, more times have people put off moves because of it or, or trying to think, or oh, you know, there's an autumn statement uh, next week or there's a budget coming up soon. Maybe we should just hold fire for a bit and see if there's a stamp duty holiday because, you know, I could say 15 grand on a, on a house buy, which is what essentially we had in the pandemic to help pop the market up, which then led to a pandemic boom, which has added on lots of uh, value to people's property. And then in recent months, after all the talk of house price crashes and mortgage rates going absolutely bonkers, well, the mortgage market has sort of slowed down a bit. We're back into sort of under 5% uh, territory for for some borrowers. House prices seem to be kind of holding steady, depending where you are. We've talked lots about this in the podcast in recent months about, you know, localised markets and what's going on. How much meddling does there need to be? Now, you could argue that, um, you know, does there need to be more measures for first-time buyers? Well, I think what first-time buyers need more of is quality uh, homes being built, more so than, uh, you know, any kind of measures for stamp duty. And the, the other thing I think that's actually kind of getting lost a little bit in what's going on, should there be a stamp duty holiday or just a permanent cut uh, for the last property you ever buy when you downsize, you know, how much is it putting off downsizers? You know, a massive part of the market where people might end up with a big three, four, five bed home, you know, all children gone. What, what do we do next? Where do we move to? And that's another bit of the market, the, the property puzzle that I think probably needs investigating and looking at. But what do, what what packages and, and things are really required? I think, as Simon says, probably more long term reform. Um, and, and Simon uh, really has banged the drum on this for many years about about how to do that. And I think that's probably worth way more than just another temporary stamp duty holiday or another ISA type product or a uh, mortgage guarantee scheme or mm, you know right. blah, blah 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 it's just stuff on stuff on stuff on stuff and it's you know where's the long-term solution to what is a pretty horribly how do i put it a horribly sculpted tax is what i was going to say and nice. it's just added horrible as i said it so now i'm gonna stop all right fair enough fair enough uh but don't stop just yet lee because i'm gonna have to ask you your likelihood scoring out of 10 that we're gonna get some sort of meddling in the property market be that stamp duty be that whatever i'm gonna give this a three out of ten. Three, okay lee three i don't know why i'm writing it down because i can't be bothered to read it out later but simon i just just for posterity what what, what are you uh thinking yeah some sort of tinkering some sort of tinkering any sort of tinkering in the property market well you know related to what we said not 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 you know the niche stuff you know the big stuff something something meaningful big i don't know another another help to buy thing nine. another why oh my god why where do you think that's going to land that nine simon ending strongly in something to do with first time buyers 
Oh, Simon, your fence sitting well, knows no just, end. You, come on. You just on. told me you told me that we weren't allowed know, to but... qualify our scores. So I gave I you an unqualified <laughs> score. And then you made me try to qualify my answer. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm the rule maker. I can easy, do what I want. Easy here, Paxman. Simon. Easy Paxman. <laughs> All right, that's it. We'll see. We'll see. I've written it down. So next week, when we talk about the autumn statement, what's actually in it, um, I can come back to our schools and see. That's it this week. You can keep up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. And if you have any comments or questions for the team, anything you'd like them to look into, Simon. You can email us at editor at thisismoney.co.uk. You can tweet us at thisismoney, where we'd love to hear your autumn statement dreams. Uh, and you can come to thismoney.co.uk forward slash podcast to find all podcasts past and join the debate and read the comments, where you can argue yep. about tax with other people. Amazing, amazing. And if you like our podcast, why not rate us wherever you found us? It helps other people find us too. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by Etoro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by Etoro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing.